So, artificial intelligence. What do you think of when I say these words and I'm going to say them loud and clear? Okay. So, as I mentioned, there are a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes about AI. And a lot of them are very present in stock photography, for example. This is one very typical image that we would see of stock uh, photography when we search for artificial intelligence. So, in order to illustrate intelligence, it features the image of a brain, but then it has to be artificial, so we surround it by a bunch of electronic circuits. And this is a really basic attempt of illustrating artificial intelligence. Another very common stereotype is the humanoid robot. So it's artificial, but we have to make it obvious that it's intelligent. So we represent it in a thinking position. Or we represent it as it's performing some kind of a human task, like using a computer. Even though for an actual robot, it wouldn't make much sense to be typing on a keyboard or using a mouse the human way. And then the third cliche is a remix of The Creation of Adam by Michelangelo. It features a human finger and a robot one dramatically touching each other and producing a divine spark. And this is called the AI creation meme. And it's so widely used that it's really fascinating how we as humans love to imagine ourselves as the creators giving life to an artificial intelligence. So I'm pretty sure you understand that none of these depictions are, accurate, uh, are very accurate. But what is AI? So I've depicted it here as a blanket, because it really is used currently as a blanket term. It doesn't refer to only one single technology or technique. Instead, it refers to a variety of different techniques. And the common thing about them is that they enable computers to perform tasks that we usually associate with human intelligence. Currently, when we say AI, we're most frequently referring to machine learning systems and their subset of deep learning, which has enabled the most recent boom in natural language processing, computer vision, and so on. These used to be tasks that we associated with human intelligence, like recognizing faces, understanding speech, and so on. But now they have passed on to the computer doable category. The way in which deep learning works is that essentially it's a way to do pattern matching at scale. It uses the so-called neural networks, which mimic the way neurons are interconnected in our brains. And it is able to process unstructured data, like images and text, in order to recognize patterns in it and tell us, for example, whether here there is a cat or not a cat. The way in which we build such a system is not by listing examples or a hard-coded uh, hard -coded list of rules. For example, you know, it, ev any cat must have a tail, must have fur, must have whiskers, and so on. Rather, we just show it all of these examples of different cats in a lot of different varieties, colors, backgrounds, situations, poses, and so on. And the same thing with dogs. We're able to show it thousands of images of dogs so that um, it can learn what they look like. And then, hopefully, by the next time we show it a new image, it would be able to tell us whether it's a cat or a dog with some level of certainty. For example, this must be an image of a cat, and I'm 85% certain because it matches other examples that I have seen in my training data, and there must be such a pattern. And this is how we build simple photo classifiers for cats and dogs, but also how we're now training some of the most novel applications for self-driving cars, autonomous flights, and so on. What you don't know is that humans play a big role in this process. They're the ones pre-processing the data so that it can be in a machine-readable format and can be used as training data for these systems. This process is called annotation, and it involves humans manually drawing on top of the images and tagging them in order to say, oh, where's the person, where's the car, where's the direction they're moving, and so on. So this process is considered to be really easy work, but it's actually very time consuming, and it needs a lot of human power. Today, there are more than 25 million workers around the world working in data annotation. And Tesla alone has a team of at least 1,000 full-time employees just in its data annotation teams. 
So data annotation is the first way in which humans participate in this AI life cycle. The second way is for humans to handle some of the work which is too difficult for AI. For example, in our cat and dog classifier, when it's deployed in the real world, it may come across examples that are too difficult or very weird or strange, and it may not have been exposed to them in its training data. So in those cases, it might be able to call a human and say, hey, I'm really unsure about this one. Is it a cat or a dog? And then the human can step in, and they can make the final call. And their decision is to use this more training data in order to further refine the AI system and improve it. And this is what we call a human-in-the-loop workflow. The role of these humans in the loop is really important and also quite normal. However, the media portrays it as scandalous. They call it the dirty little secret of AI, and any startup which is found to be using humans is dismissed as not real artificial intelligence. So companies also naturally tend to hide the fact that they're using such human workers because they're afraid of a potential backlash. For example, one tech startup launched a food robot delivery service on the campus of UC Berkeley in California in 2019, and they quickly became a sensation. People loved their cute kawaii style, they took pictures with them, and so on. However, it turned out that these robots were actually being remotely operated by humans in Colombia being paid less than $2 an hour. And then the media protested. They said that these robots have much less autonomy than what it initially appears, and they're actually operated remotely by humans in their delivery journey. So this was really bad PR for a company that was trying to frame itself as an AI startup. Another company used to offer the services of a chatbot called Amy, who could act as the personal secretary of users and schedule meetings for them. So for example, Michael would invite me for a coffee, and I would say, yes, I would love to. I would copy Amy and my response, and I would say, Amy will send you some slots when I'm free. So we as users would feel very important, and uh, Amy would respond as a real human secretary, and she would send some slots from your calendar when you would be free for a coffee. However, a media investigation found out that there were teams of human operators pulling long shifts, checking, and rewriting Amy's responses so that she could sound as natural and as eloquent as possible. The company, however, never publicly revealed the involvement of humans in their AI systems because they preferred to maintain their motto of their AI magically scheduling meetings. And this may have been also because users may have felt embarrassed that there were real people reading their emails and their personal correspondence instead of a robotic secretary. Imagine, for example, that every time when you use Alexa or Siri, there was an actual human listening to your conversation. However, I hate to break it to you, but there are such humans who are constantly checking voice recordings, they're transcribing your commands and your words, and they're working to improve the AI system for you. However, we as humans also expect everything labeled as AI to work in a magical, autonomous way. And this is why in order to convince us as their customers, companies are falling, whoops, sorry, I forgot to show you the, the operators here. So um, companies, in order to convince us that what they're selling us is really, really advanced, they're, call, they're falling into a fallacy called fox automation. Fox automation is basically the overselling of high-tech systems that aren't actually fully automated yet. They appear to replace humans, like the AI secretary, but humans are still doing the work in the background. Companies are falling in this illusion because they want to be able to sell us uh, AI systems that are fully autonomous, they are infinitely scalable, and they have a superhuman accuracy. But their AI systems are just not good enough yet, and they cannot afford the reputational damage of potential blunders and errors. So using a human in the loop can be a really helpful technique, and also it proves to be very cost effective because using a remote operator in Colombia being paid less than $2 an hour is a much cheaper option than having an actual delivery person in California. So this is how a lot of these tasks end up becoming outsourced to the so-called developing countries, 
where AI operators and annotators are working out of sight. In fact, researchers have claimed that automation never fully replaces human labor. It simply displaces it to another location. And this is how ghost work comes to be. This is a term used to describe the thousands of hidden workers who are powering some of the most widely used AI systems today, but they're receiving low wages and unstable contract work. The problem is that a lot of them are working as gig or as freelance workers, and they're not eligible for minimum wage protections or benefits because companies do not consider them as real employees. One of the platforms that hosts the biggest number of such gig workers is Amazon's Mechanical Turk. They uh, offer both researchers and companies the opportunity to log in and submit what are called human intelligence tasks with a minimum payment of one cent per task. They can receive the results back within minutes without ever interacting with the nameless humans completing them. This labor is then used to power a lot of AI systems that may be quite expensive. And they're also producing a lot of cost savings for customers and their clients in terms of the automation that they produce. However, the workers are not receiving the benefits of these gains. And their contribution is not recognized because their work is considered menial and easy. While in fact, it's really not. It requires a lot of patience, focus, attention to detail, ability to interpret instructions and the data, and a lot of other human skills. But today, human intelligence can be as cheap as ever, while anything labeled as artificial intelligence can earn thousands in revenue and investments. So by now, it should be obvious that artificial intelligence is not really artificial. In fact, it's not really intelligent either. At least not yet. It still needs humans in order to be able to deal with the complexity of our world. Because when the AI system is deployed and it's interacting with real users and it's um, also uh, working on real life data, it really can be very confusing and it may not be prepared for this. In fact, data scientists refer to this as deployment in the wild. Because when the AI system is deployed in the real world, it really can be a big jungle out there. So now is the time to start appreciating and normalizing the role of humans in the loop. We as users need to become much more comfortable with the idea that there are still humans behind some of the AI systems that we use on a daily basis. And that's actually for the better, because we don't want to be served by an AI system which suddenly goes rogue without any human supervision. Companies, on the other hand, need to be give much more light to search workers and to normalize them as an essential part of any complex AI project. This also comes with more protection for their labor rights and a better remuneration, which places value on their expertise and skills. So as today's topic is shaping utopia, I think it's a great opportunity for us to think about our future together with AI. Because as AI becomes more and more commonplace, more and more humans are going to be needed in order to train it, supervise it, maintain it, and so on. And in an AI-centric world, these humans are going to end up being slaves to the AI systems. But if we try to use a human-centric approach, we might be able to turn this around and use AI in order to benefit us and augment our capabilities rather than displacing us. And a key way to do this is by preserving human control over AI. Or, said in other words, by keeping the human in the loop. Thank you.